Good afternoon, everyone. I'm listening to them so we can correct me about the health center for law and public policy here at Boston College Law School. And I'll be happy. Dan Kenstrom, our faculty director, and that is Jim Bell, our administrative assistant. Welcome to the kickoff program for the spring semester. <laughs> As most of you know, the Rappaport Center strives to bring timely programs with compelling and dynamic speakers. We are delighted to continue that tradition by starting this semester's programming with Chase Boudin, former district attorney from San Francisco, who joins us as the Rappaport Senior Fellow in Residence. A few years ago, the ACLU here in Massachusetts launched a campaign entitled, What a Difference a Deep Makes. The goal was to educate our voters about the power of the district attorney. As the ACLU explained, quote, district attorneys are the most powerful people in the criminal justice system. They decide who gets charged with a crime and determine how most criminal are resolved, unquote. This past week, we have all experienced the horror of Tyree Nichols murder at the hands of five depraved and inhumane police officers. Those police officers have been charged with second degree murder. Who should be prosecuted? And for what is within the supreme power of the district attorney? How does poverty, ill health, substance abuse disorders, and lack of life's resources affect what charges are brought? We'll hear more about those topics today. And in two days on Wednesday, Chesa Boudin will be joined by Suffolk County District Attorney Kevin Rudy for a conversation moderated by Professor Mike Cassidy about the future of progressive prosecutions. Unfortunately, U.S. Attorney Rachel Rollins had to cancel the end of the conflict. She asked me to let you know specifically that she called me first week this weekend to express her disappointment and to share that she loves the Rappaport Center and is a longtime friend and supporter. We are delighted that Donna Padalano, who is former general counsel of the Suffolk DA's office when Rachel Rollins was in office and was also former chair of the Massachusetts Board of Bar Overseers, has kindly agreed to step in. We have the added bonus that Donna Padalano is one of our illustrious alums here at BC Boston. A week later, on February 7th in the virtual program, we'll be wrestling with the fund of action with two of the lawyers who argued the cases, the most recent cases, to the Supreme Court. Patrick Strawbridge, who argued on behalf of the plaintiffs, and David Minahosa, one of the lawyers who argued on behalf of the defendants. It will be a discussion moderated by longtime litigator and quite legendary law professor Ted Shaw, from the University of North Carolina, as well as Professor Marjorie Salvador, a professor of history, language, and global culture at Suffolk. That program is co sponsored by Lahanis, the BC Forum on Racial Justice in America, and the Law Schools Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion and Belonging Committee. Continuing to contemplate admissions policies in education, a week after that, on February 15th, We'll be looking at the Boston Public School admission policies for the exam schools. A hot topic. The panelists for that program are our very own Professor Mary Hofer, who is a BPS parent, Rachel Skerritt, former Boston Latin student, and more notably, former Boston Latin headmaster, Tanisha Sullivan, president of the NAACP Boston, and Melanie Brzezinski a PhD student at Harvard's Graduate School of Ed, who's been writing on this topic. That program will be moderated by Rebecca Levine Coley, a professor here at the Lynch School of Education. A bit further down the road, watch for our program on affordable home ownership. That will be with our next Rappaport Senior Fellow in Residence, Danielle Kinkle, who is the General Counsel of Mass Housing Partnership. You'll be getting lots of emails and notices, so stay tuned. Now, the reason we're all here, I have the pleasure of introducing Chase of the team. 
Yale undergrad, as well as Yale Law School. He was a world scholar. He clerked in the U.S. District for the Ninth Circuit for a few months. He served as a deputy in 2019. He was elected San Francisco District Attorney. I'm going to let him tell you about the many accomplishments. In June 2022, he was the subject of a recall elect and based on his progressive prosecution principles and initiatives. He lost the election, and the one small silver lining for us is that it enabled us to bring him here for three days as our wrap up for senior Bella. So please join me in welcoming. Thank you. Thank you, Lizzie. Thank you, Abby, for helping coordinate and make this possible. And also thank you, Dan, for your work with the center. Um, I'm just curious to see briefly how many of you are from the Boston area? We could show a hand. So my dad was born and, and grew up in the Brookline area, and he encouraged me to try out my Boston accent during this talk. <laughs> but I'm not going to do that. I don't do accents well. Um, I really appreciate you all bring me, I appreciate you um, gathering such a large and interesting group of people. And when I say interested, I know that the true test of how well attended any event in a law school setting is, is the quality of the lunch. Uh, if this were pizza, we'd probably have about two thirds the number of people in the room. And if there were no lunch at all, it'd probably be empty. But uh, I'm glad that you all are being well fed. Thank you for arranging that, Abby. And, uh, and thank you all for coming and for your interest in this topic. I mentioned my dad, and I do want to kind of start off going all the way back to the beginning of my life. Um, and I'll spend most of my time today talking about the work I did in office and about the state of the criminal justice reform movement, about the role that I believe prosecutors can and should play in that broader movement. But I want to start really just uh, with my own lived experience to provide context for the work I did during my two and a half years in office. I was born in New York, and when I was just a year old, both of my parents left me at the babysitter. They never came back again. That day while I was playing, they were driving the getaway car in an armed robbery that left three men, two of them police officers dead. Even though my parents weren't armed and didn't personally hurt anybody, they were arrested and ultimately sentenced to long prison terms. They're both out of prison now. They served a combined total of 62 years in prison. My mom did 22 years and my dad did 40 years before his release a little over a year ago. Talk a lot about their case and the history and what motivated it, but that's not the subject of today's conversation. I mention it for a different reason, which is simply to say that my entire childhood was defined in many ways by my parents' incarceration. I, like millions and millions of other American children grew up having to go through metal detectors and steel gates just to see my parents, just to be able to give them a hug. And even before I understood what racism was or what white supremacy was, I noticed that the lines at those prison gates were mostly black and brown women and children. Even before I understood or had heard the term mass incarceration, I was seeing and living and experiencing the failures of this country's approach to criminal justice, to crime, to punishment. Let me give you just three basic examples of what I learned during years, decades of prison visits about the failures of this system. So the first thing I noticed was that our system was not rehabilitating anybody. It's not what it was set up to do. It's not where the resources were dedicated. Take California, for example, with one of the biggest prison systems in the world, the state that I call home. About 2% of the billions of dollars that go to our Department of Corrections, just 2% are aimed at rehabilitative programs. It's not a priority. It's not something we invest in. And no surprise, on the back end, it's not making our community safer. That's the second lesson I learned. That it's not really working to make our community safer. We're destroying families. We're taking parents away from their kids. We're depriving young men primarily of the years during which they should be educating themselves and starting businesses and raising families. And 
when people get released, which 99% of those arrested do, they are worse off than before their arrest. They're more likely to end up getting rearrested and causing more harm in the community. And there are real people who suffer as a result. And that gets me to a third lesson, a critical one that I learned from my lived experience. Our system does not lift up or support or address the harm of crime victims. When I went to law school, it was before there was such a thing as a progressive prosecutor movement. It was before, in many ways, the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement and, and so much of what has defined many of your adult lives. And so I went to law school hoping to learn the skill to fight against mass incarceration. When I graduated after my clerkship, I became a public defender. I, I tried more than two dozen criminal cases in front of San Francisco juries. And I grew frustrated by the systemic inequities and inequalities and the ways in which the system that I was part of, even as a public defender, the ways in which that system was exacerbating and amplifying racial disparities and social structural failings that were way upstream of the criminal legal system, right? Problems that had to do with lack of access to healthcare, education, housing, employment, ended up getting dumped on the criminal legal system. <clears throat> And I saw that time and time again, even when I achieved the best possible outcome for my clients, a dismissal of a case, a, a not guilty verdict at trial, that they were going right back into the same underinvested, overpoliced, under resourced communities, and often didn't have any opportunities to turn their lives around. And many of them would come back into the system. And I, I have a 17-month-old uh, son at home, so I actually am thrilled that uh, there's a baby in the front row. And I'm going to have to tell my wife later that even though I wasn't changing uh, our son's diaper this week, I was still nevertheless getting the energy of, uh, of a young one. So thank you for bringing him. Yeah, thank you. Um, six months? Yeah. <laughs> Just wait till he starts walking all down the aisle. It's really good work. Think, oh, it's great that you start walking and you know, they're growing and learning, and it's great. You take video when you can put them down and leave them there safely. Nothing like that, <laughs> it's a lot harder. Um, so, so I saw these problems structurally, and it led me as a public defender to start doing work that most public defenders don't really do. Right? Most public defenders, you, you have a massive caseload, and all you can all you can manage is just to focus on those cases one at a time. I started, and I was lucky to have support from my office, doing more structural work around immigration uh, detention and persuaded our local sheriff to stop cooperating with ICE. And then around bail reform. And I was able to get involved in impact litigation, challenging the use of money bail. All, all topics I'm happy to delve into in more detail if, if there's time and interest. Um, but what I realized as I looked around the country at places like Boston where Rachel Rowland Philadelphia with Larry Krasner and, and so many other jurisdictions were electing prosecutors who saw themselves as part of this national criminal justice reform movement. And as Lindsay said, the ACLU and many other national organizations were putting the focus on this uniquely powerful role. That coincided with the first time in more than 100 years in San Francisco history when there was a district attorney election with no incumbent listed on the ballot. We can and maybe we'll have time to talk about why it is that in 110 years, there was always somebody with the title district attorney next to their name running for office, why we didn't have open elections and what that says about the structural flaws in, in our democracy or the machine politics in cities like Boston, Chicago, San Francisco. But it seemed to me, perhaps naively, like, a once in a lifetime opportunity. And I wanted somebody who believed in criminal justice reform to run for that office. A lot of people stepped forward. There were four candidates in the race, but nobody who really had lived or experienced or understood what the criminal justice reform movement was all about. And it was in January of 2019, as the fifth candidate, I threw my hat in the ring. San Francisco uses ranked choice voting. Uh, another topic for another day, but I ended up winning the election with just 42% of the vote. Took office in January of 2020, 
two months later, COVID shuts down. That's the topic we'll dive into a little bit later with some of you this afternoon um, in Dan's class that I'm going to be speaking at. But I want to focus what's left of my time on the work we did while I was in office. And I want to talk very specifically about some of the policies we implemented. And I'm going to do so in three broad categories. These are the same principles that I campaigned on transparently, explicitly, intentionally. I decided, unlike most politicians, that I wanted to run a campaign where we were extremely detailed in our website, in our policy proposals. And I did that for a simple reason. I knew that if I won, I would face pushback for the policy that I was going to implement. And I wanted to be able to clearly say, this is what I promised you I would do. This is what I was elected to do. And I knew that if I lost, I could still play a useful role in advancing the policy conversations amongst the other candidates, but only if I was detailed, concrete, and specific about how I intended to address longstanding problems like racial disparities, like police brutality, like systemic failure to provide language access to non-English speaking people, just to give a few examples. The three broad categories that I campaigned on were first of all, ending mass incarceration, right? reducing reliance on jails and prisons as a primary response to all social problems. And second, taking resources we saved through decreasing the number of people in cages and re-diverting those resources, not only to diversion programs, collaborative courts, and alternatives to incarceration, but also to meaningful investment in victim services. Second emphasis, victim services. Third one was what I'll call equal enforcement of the law. Now, you all hear probably every day in your classes the term equal protection. It comes up certainly in constitutional law and many, many other classes. But we also know that laws are not enforced equally. We know that whether it's civil or criminal in this country, we have one system of justice for those with resources and connections and another for everybody else. And I wanted to make sure that we were using the authority and enforcement power of the district attorney to enforce laws equally without regard to skin color, to how much money somebody has in their bank account, or to how well connected or powerful the person being investigated or prosecuted is. So I'm gonna talk briefly about each of those three categories. And I'll admit at the outset that they blend together in certain ways. So how do we go about reducing the number of people in our jails and prisons? You know, the easiest way to reduce juvenile detention, if you're looking at basically three categories of incarceration, that a district attorney has some authority over, right? There's juvenile, there's adult pretrial jail, and then there's state prison. And the easiest way to reduce the number of juveniles in detention is to charge more of them as adults. The easiest way to reduce the number of people in county jail is to send more of them to prison faster, get them out of the jail. We reduced by double digits the number of people in each of those three categories during my first year alone. The number of juveniles in our detention center, we reduced by about 75%. The number of adults in our jail, we reduced by about 40%. And the number of adults in our state prison out of San Francisco County's jurisdiction, we reduced by about 25%. One of the ways we reduced the number of juveniles was by taking seriously the legal mandate to consider the best interest of the child. We didn't do it by charging juveniles as adults. In fact, on the campaign show, never to charge a juvenile as adult. And I stood by that promise despite tremendous political pressure, including from our mayor, to do otherwise. But what we did was we looked at how we could actually intervene in ways that were helpful in these children's lives. And I don't want to pretend that we didn't ever hold some kids in custody. We did in murder cases or other very, very serious violent crimes. But what we learned was that most of the people in our juvenile jail were there because they were mentally ill and homeless. Let me just let that sink in for a minute. Most of the people in San Francisco's juvenile detention center, the kids, were there because they were mentally ill and homeless. I don't believe, and I didn't believe as district attorney, that it was appropriate to cage human beings because of their poverty or because of their mental illness, particularly when they are children who all of us owe a debt of care and respect to. 
And so we work with community partners to find how to and to find placements. And we didn't issue warrants to arrest people who didn't show up simply because of low level offenses. We let their probation officers work with them in the community instead. Our adult jail population we reduced, as I said, by more than 40%. When I took office, there was between 12 and 1300 people in our county jail on any given day, many of them living in a part of the jail known as County Jail 4, the, the, the top floor of our Hall of Justice. The area where I went many, 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 many countless times to visit my own clients as a public defender, an area that had been the subject of numerous lawsuits that had cost the city millions of dollars in settlements. Why? Because it was a seismically unsafe building. And if there was an earthquake, something that happens all the time in San Francisco, a serious one, the entire building would collapse, killing the people locked in the jail, but also the staff that worked in the jail on the night shift or whenever the earthquake happened, the sheriff deputies, the Department of Public Health, nurses, and so on. Also, putting aside the seismic issues, there were daily sewage floods in this jail. The plumbing didn't work. It was so bad, in fact, it wasn't just impacting the people living in the jail or working in the jail, but years before I came, became district attorney, I remember going to court to our master calendar department and seeing one of the assistant district attorneys on the domestic violence team getting called up in front of the judge. And the judge said, are the people ready for trial? And the assistant district attorney said, your honor, we are not ready. And the judge said, well, last week you were ready. What, this is not acceptable. We've got a courtroom, we're gonna send you out. And the assistant district attorney said, your honor, I was ready last week. There's been a sewage flood and my file has been covered in human feces. Probation, the district attorney's office, all had sewage leaking down from the jail into their offices. The city had made it a priority to close this jail and for years had not made progress. We closed it my first year in office. And we did that by doing the difficult work of looking every day, day in, day out, day in, day out, at who was actually in the jail and asking the question, should they be here? Is there somewhere else more appropriate for them to be? And in that process, we found some horrifying things. We found, for example, a young woman pregnant, high-risk pregnancy. She was serving her first ever jail sentence, no criminal history, for a misdemeanor during the COVID pandemic. And the head of jail health services said to us, we are really worried about her and her fears. This is not a safe place for her to be, right? We think about jail and policing and prosecutors as wanting to promote public safety. And in that moment, I had a choice to make. Do we require this young pregnant woman to serve the remainder of her jail sentence? Or do we find an alternative? And which one of those options would really advance public safety? Not just for her, not just for her unborn fetus, but for everybody else, maybe for the people charged with murder, who we really think do need to stay in the jail, but we don't want to give them a death sentence through a contagious disease like COVID-19. Well, that young woman, I'm pleased to tell you, had her sentence reduced to time served. The judge signed off on it, and we had her transported directly from the jail to a residential prenatal facility where she was able to stay for the remainder of her pregnancy, where she stayed sober, where she gave birth to a healthy baby, and she hasn't come back into the system since. Yeah, see, we can all celebrate that. <laughs> the Decisions that we had to make in that context in March and April and May and June of 2020 were decisions that highlighted just how arbitrary in many ways the power and the punishment that we meet out in our criminal legal system are. We started doing something that was done around the country, which is we looked at people who were serving county jail sentences and were within the last 60 days of their sentence. Maybe they were in a year already or 10 months. And we reduced their sentence, not in every case, but in most cases, to time served. Ask yourself, what public safety benefit do we achieve by keeping somebody that extra day or week or month? Well, if they go out and commit another crime, it's easy to blame the district attorney or the judge that signed off on it and say, but for their early release, that crime would not have occurred. <laughs> The vast majority didn't and don't commit new crime. And when we invest in reentry planning, when we have transitional supports, housing, jobs, anger management, drug treatment, depending on the particular needs of the individual, we saw the recidivism or rearrest rates plummet even further. 
closed the jail that was costing the city about $40 million. Now, I wish that we had had access to all of those savings, that our office could have directed that money. But that's not how local government works, right? Checks and balances. We have a mayor. We have a board of supervisors. The jail budget isn't even in the DA's office budget. It's the sheriff's department. So some of that money we were able to redeploy towards veteran services. And I want to talk about what we did in that category. And I, and I think, not to be too meta, but I think that it's worth interrogating the question of whether or not victim services should even be housed within district attorney's offices. I think there's a good argument for district attorneys to be separate from the provision of services to them for all kinds of reasons we can talk more about if we have time. But I inherited an office that had a victim services division, and I wanted to make it as robust as possible. In that role as district attorney, I wanted to make sure I and our city were doing absolutely everything in our power to support victims in the process of healing and recovering from the harm they suffered. Now, I want to give you kind of a point of comparison, a point of contrast with what we did or tried to do and how many DA's offices around the country operate. In many DA's offices, victims of crime are only eligible for services if they cooperate with prosecution. In other words, let's say you're a survivor of domestic violence and you don't want to testify against your spouse, perhaps because they're an immigrant and you worry that your cooperation will lead to a conviction that leads to removal from the country, that leads to your children not being able to see their father. If you don't cooperate, most DA's offices will not give you any access to services. We obviously didn't do that. Most DA's offices don't have any services at all for people who are victims of property crime, by far the most common category of crime in San Francisco. And worse still, Many district attorneys use their power. I like that Chicago Cup sticker. Uh, most, um, most district attorneys use their power under material witness statute to subpoena and mandate cooperation from witnesses that they think are essential to their case. And what does that look like in practice? It means if you're a survivor of domestic violence or sexual assault, that you're a witness to a murder and the DA thinks that you won't show up and testify, they will hold you in jail as a victim or a witness pending trial so that you can be marched out when you're needed to provide evidence. In other words, you are a piece of evidence. It's inhuman. It undermines justice. It undermines legitimacy and trust in the system. And absolutely under no circumstances are we going to do anything like that. But I wanted to go further. I wanted to go the other direction. And so when the pandemic started and we realized that victims of domestic violence were being forced to shelter in place with their abusers. We partnered with other local city agencies that developed a 911 text message service so that people could get help without having to make a phone call that could lead to retaliation while they were waiting for help to arrive. And more importantly, we partnered with Airbnb and with local real estate companies to develop short, medium, and long-term housing where survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault could leave the home and not be on the streets. Similarly, we pushed back on our local police agencies' use of certain kinds of evidence that dehumanized and violated the rights of victims. So for example, anybody here watch SVU TV show? You didn't see it. So there was an episode um, six months or a year ago called Tangled Strands of Justice. I think it was episode 21, but I don't watch it. <laughs> it's the only episode I've ever seen. And that episode is based on something we did in my office. They fictionalized it a lot, obviously. But what happens in that episode, what happened in my office is we identified a case in which a young woman was being prosecuted for a property crime. And it turned out that the way the police had identified her was DNA. And we don't usually see police doing DNA tests in property crime cases. It's very rare, as a matter of fact. It's too many property crimes, not enough resources. And it was brought to my attention, and it was curious. How did they get her DNA, and why was it in the database? And it turned out that this young woman had been the victim of a sexual assault years earlier, that she'd come forward to seek prosecution of the person who assaulted her, that she had the courage to submit her body to an invasive evidentiary gathering process 
And that then the police, without her consent, without telling her, without any legal authority, had taken her DNA sample and put it into a database that they used to test every unknown DNA sample against for years. And one day, there was a match to a suspect in a property crime. And they used that to file criminal charges against her. And my office was prosecuted. But we dismissed the case. We went public with our concerns about this practice. We didn't know how many hundreds or thousands of other cases might have been contaminated in the same way. And I'm proud to tell you that our board of supervisors unanimously passed a resolution prohibiting the San Francisco Police Department from ever maintaining or using such a database in the future. And I co-sponsored with our local state senator a state law that would similarly prohibit any law enforcement agency across the state of California from abusing the trust of survivors of sexual assault or any survivor of violent crime in that way. These are not controversial positions, and yet it required independent leadership. It required someone who was not simply telling the party line. I will tell you, there were career prosecutors in my office in high-ranking positions who I had inherited when I took over, who fought against us dismissing that case who fought against us trying to change that policy, who thought of creative technical ways that maybe we could do an end run around the violation of that woman's Fourth Amendment rights. Not on my watch. Those are just a couple examples of the ways in which we expanded support for victims. I wanna give you one other before I transition to the last big topic and, and, and then save time for questions. Language access is a privilege. Victims, of crime, their family members and homicide cases in particular want to know what's happened. They want to be able to watch the court proceedings. They want to be able to understand the rulings that the judge makes. Now in California, we have one of the most advanced, rigorous, robust victims bill of rights in the country. It's called Marcy's Law. It's, it's written into the California state constitution, article one, section 28. All kinds of rights are afforded to victims of crime, right? To be informed if there is a change in the custody status, to have an opportunity to be heard in any substantive hearing in the case, all kinds of things. But those rights are rights without remedies when they're violated, and they're rights that don't come with any mandated funding for enforcement. Why is this a problem? Well, it means that in a practical matter, day in, day out, all across the state of California, victims' rights, constitutional rights, are violated. And they have no recourse. Ironic that I was sued for allegedly not doing enough to advance victims' rights in this category of language access, among others, by a disgruntled victim who had received more services from my office than any other county in the state would have provided, and that that lawsuit was used primarily as fodder for the recall, and then voluntarily withdrawn and dismissed without us even filing a single motion in response. But it got headlines. We did know that we had a real problem when I took office with language access. That much was true. We have lots and lots of languages spoken in San Francisco. Spanish, of course, Chinese, primarily Cantonese, Mandarin as well, Vietnamese, Tagalog, Arabic, Russian, many, many languages. And when I took over, we had one victim advocate who spoke Chinese, just one. 30% of our voters are Chinese in San Francisco. So we hired and promoted. By the time I left, we had, I think, six full-time Chinese-speaking language uh, victim advocates. But more importantly than just hiring and retaining diverse staff, most of whom, by the way, have been fired since I was removed, we implemented a policy, the first in the state of California, that required our victim advocates, no matter what language they spoke, to request a court-certified interpreter to participate in observing court with victims for any hearing where the victims chose to attend. In other words, if you're the mother of a young who was killed and your only language is Thai, and nobody in the office speaks Thai, that's okay. We're gonna request a Thai-speaking professional court-certified interpreter to keep you company during the proceedings so you understand what's being said in your son's case. It's basic. And yet nobody in the country is doing things like this. If we take seriously the rhetoric that police unions, 
tough on crime advocates use around victims' rights, then let's take seriously the need to invest in helping heal, support, and empower our victims and realizing the rights that they already have on paper, but which in practice, they're told that the only measure of justice in their case is length of incarceration. We cannot continue to conflate supporting victims with lengthy sentences. Yes, some, perhaps many victims want that. They want long sentences. They want the death penalty in trespass cases sometimes. Prosecutors do not represent victims, but they can play a critical role in helping them to realize their rights, to stay informed, and directing resources to healing, to support, to moving on to closure. One of the categories of victims that are often ignored are victims of police violence. Go watch or read about, some of us chose not to watch the horrific video at Memphis from earlier this month. While reading today, yesterday, about the problematic role of emergency medical first responders and failing to provide immediate life saving support to someone who ultimately died. It will surprise you that when police use force in cases like the one in Memphis or so many others across the country, from Minnesota to Texas to California to Massachusetts, police then go back to their office and they write a report. And regardless of what happened, regardless of the particular facts, one thing is always true. The person who was injured or killed by police use of force is listed as a suspect, not a victim. In every single one of those police reports, I don't care what jurisdiction it's in. I'll appreciate and understand why that might be the case, but it leads to a very problematic outcome, which is that if you get killed by police in California, our Crime Victim Compensation Board, a state body, will not provide your family with funeral and burial expense support. It will not provide any reimbursement for medical costs or ambulances. It will not provide any of the therapy or other referrals that victims of other forms of violence are entitled to under state law because the police report says you're a suspect, not a victim. So we implemented a first in the state policy during my administration to guarantee all victims of violence, even if they're victims of police violence, access to the same resources. We didn't want mothers and young men killed at the hands of the state to rely on GoFundMe pages to bury their sons. That policy became a model that was introduced to state law in Sacramento and is still pending. And we knew that when it comes to police violence in other areas, it is not enough simply to support victims. We also have to start enforcing laws equally. This is the third point I want to talk about. I filed the first in San Francisco history homicide charges against a police officer who shot and killed an unarmed black man. First in the city's history. We also brought to trial the first ever use of force case against an officer accused of excessive force on duty. Now, I know most of you aren't from San Francisco. We got Chicago in the house and a lot of people from the Boston area. But I want to just ask a question. San Francisco has been around a long time. Not as long as Boston. Does anybody really believe that until I came around, there was never a single case where a police officer used criminal excessive force? And I want to see a hand if anybody believes that. Right. A single person. Obviously, there were cases where police officers used criminal excessive force, but they never once went to trial until my administration. And the police department and the police officers association and the conservative local media had a field day. If we had not made the efforts we made to hold police account in those cases, I wouldn't have gotten recalled. Even in the aftermath of George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter, even in the aftermath, just two days ago, there was a headline in the San Francisco Chronicle where they're accusing me of misconduct for filing homicide charges against an officer who shot and killed a uh, black man. The officer was fired immediately because he did the shooting in a way that violated policy. And yet the defense attorney's motion to dismiss is headline news. There are some people who've done criminal defense practice in your summers or you will go on to do it. I know Dan used to practice criminal defense and led the criminal defense clinic here at BC Law. 
the defense attorney's job is to file motions to dismiss the case. But in police violent cases, it becomes headline news, giving credence and credibility to arguments that the defense lawyers make, which are aimed, by the way, to distract from the facts of the case that a young black man was shot to the neck while on arms, while running for his life. That the officer who did it was fired because the department knew the shooting through a closed car door window was in violation of office policy. And yet the headlines are not about the shooting, are not about the facts of the case, or about a defense motion. I know when you were a defense lawyer, Dan, you would have loved to have headline news every time you filed a motion alleging something had been done wrong by the police or by the prosecutor in your office. But there's a double standard. And that double standard permeates every aspect of our legal system. It's why I created a worker protection unit dedicated. In fact, the lawyer who runs that unit graduated from Northeastern Law School here in Boston, dedicated to enforcing civilly and criminally laws that protect our workers. Police bring us theft or burglary cases where some individual business or resident has been violated, where their car has been broken into, where their business has been burglarized, where their purse has been stolen, and we prosecute those cases. Police aren't bringing us cases when companies like DoorDash are systematically stealing from tens of thousands of their employees by misclassifying them as independent contractors. I brought that case. I created the unit to investigate labor trafficking, not just sex trafficking, but labor trafficking, even if the labor involved isn't sexual in nature. Categories of cases that police will never investigate, that DA is if they sit back and wait for police or other local law enforcement agencies to bring them, we'll never investigate. And when we talk about safety, in my mind, there is no bigger threat to public safety than guns and gun violence. The traditional approach that district attorneys take is to wait for police to arrest somebody in possession of a gun or who's used a gun and to prosecute that person. And if they're really tough, or they want you to think they are, then they'll send that individual to jail or prison for a longer and longer period of time. They'll even go to the state legislature and they'll ask for the laws to be changed so they can send people to prison for longer than the current law allows. That's how we traditionally define the toughness of our prosecutors. What seemed to me as district attorney that ghost gun, guns that have, you should stay if you want to, I'm totally, I'm uh, in, at my house, there's a baby pile all the time. And I don't want you to draw any negative inferences from that, but it's kind of hard for the course. So the fact that he's so he's doing great. He's doing great. Um the uh you know the the the, the category of guns that are the most problematic that were responsible for fully half of gun-related homicides in San Francisco, my first year in office, that are being used in crimes ranging from carjacking to murder across the country at an exponentially increasing rate are called ghost guns, guns that don't have serial numbers, that are made specifically to be sold to people who don't comply with whatever local gun control regulations are, that you can buy over the internet, even if you're not 18, even if you have a prior felony conviction, even if you have a domestic violence restraining order against you, even if you're on probation or have recently committed another crime. These guns are shipped to people all across the country. Well, I got tough on gun violence, which I filed a civil suit against the three companies manufacturing those guns in California. That case was so important that the Attorney General of the state of California decided to join in after we had filed it. It was so significant that one of those three manufacturers immediately after we filed the suit announced that they were no longer shipping guns within the state of California. And the other two are still fighting us in litigation. But that's a way we can get tough on crime. That's what we can get at the root causes of things that drive violence and lack of safety in our community. That's the way we can recognize the historic inequity and racial disparities that district attorneys have amplified without actually addressing the root causes. We did that work. And because we took on powerful corporations, because we took on police officers, because we took on billionaires in their boardrooms who were stealing from workers, they spent more money than has ever been spent in any San Francisco campaign in the middle of my first term in office, when most of my time had been spent governing via Zoom to recall them, and they succeeded. And some people, hot takes on election night, were all about this is the death knell of the progressive prosecutor movement, if not in San Francisco, then where? 
And I want to speak very briefly before I open up for questions about that, because I am optimistic, I am energized, and I believe that our movement is growing stronger all the time. Of course, we have our setbacks. Of course, we have our defeats, as my election represented. But in the same election cycle as I lost my recall, Sarah Fair George in Burlington, Vermont, was reelected to a second term despite all of the police union attacks on her. George Gascon in Los Angeles, who they tried to recall not once but twice within his first six months in office, beat the second recall attempt, even though they spent nearly $10 million just on paid signature gathering. And critically to our conversation today and the world events that we're all following this week, the district attorney in Nashville, who just filed criminal charges against the five police officers for murder, was elected. Memphis, thank you. Steve Mulroy ran on a reform Democratic ticket against an incumbent Republican. An re incumbent Republican who, by the way, had not only never prosecuted police officers for violence, but who had prosecuted young Black women for trying to register to vote. Our reform movement is strong, it is growing, it is broadening, and progress is always going to be two steps forward, one step back. But San Francisco is not representative of the trends in the rest of the country. San Francisco has 3% of its voters that are black. You look at places like Chicago or Philadelphia with progressive prosecutors who are under relentless attack, the same kinds of coordinated efforts that I faced, but they have large black and brown voting populations. Kim Fox in Chicago, Larry Krasner in Philadelphia reelected like Sarah Fair George in Vermont with overwhelming majorities of the vote to second terms. I had the disadvantage of having a electorate that was almost entirely non-black and a jail that was 50% black and no opponent to run against because recalls, it's just yes or no. Don't draw the lessons that the hot takes on election night tried to teach from our recall. It is a sui generis, there's a Latin phrase you probably hear a lot in law school, uh, electorate and dynamic when it comes to recalls. Um, I think there's a lot of really exciting work happening in places in coast to coast. I would love to hear your questions about the work we did, about the state of the movement, or any of the other issues that I raised in the last hour. Students, we'll do a couple and in person. We have some questions online. Yes, your baby is going to move. I'm sorry for any distraction. <laughs> I really wanted to come, but couldn't find a baby for him, so here we go. I've been there. Uh, <laughs> but I just have a, a broad question about how you feel restorative justice plays into the role of progressive prosecution. Thank you for the question. Thank you for bringing the baby. <laughs> uh, so, restorative justice. I view as a victim's rights issue. And one of the things that I campaigned on was a commitment to try to build out infrastructure so that every victim of every crime in San Francisco would have the right, if they chose, to participate in restorative justice. Now, restorative justice is a broad term and it can encompass a lot of different things. And one of the things that we saw the far right wing in San Francisco and on Twitterverse do was every time somebody who had been arrested during my administration would get rearrested, they would say, this is Boudin's restorative justice, without regard to whether or not the person had been charged, prosecuted, what, what had happened in the case. Um, for me, restorative justice is also something that's very personal because my family used restorative justice principles to help me overcome a lot of the challenges and anger and developmental issues that I faced stemming from my parents' incarceration. I know that if I hadn't been able to visit my parents, if I hadn't been able to um, rebuild the bond that was broken when they were arrested, if I hadn't been able to learn that it wasn't my fault that they went and committed that crime, or that, it, that I, I wasn't responsible for persuading them not to go, um, then I don't think I would have been able to harness all of my energy and put it into productive outlets that got me into Yale and Yale Law School and a road scholarship and all the other things that Lizzie boards with in the beginning of the of the of the of the program. Right. Um, because I was getting suspended from school. I was having temper tantrums and outbursts when I was a kid. Um, but we used 
communication, visitation, and restorative practices for me to find ways to explain to my parents the harm they caused to me, the harm I knew they caused to other people and who were victims of crime, and for them to demonstrate through their actions over many years that they were not bad people, even though they had done a terrible thing. Now, restorative justice can look a lot of ways. The simplest example for folks who aren't familiar is if somebody spray paints your fence, graffiti, right, they tag your fence, the traditional criminal justice approach is give them a criminal conviction, put them in jail for a week or a month, and put them on probation. Well, that doesn't do a whole lot for you and your fence. Restorative justice approach said, well, you might need maybe more than them to sit in jail for a week is them to repaint your fence. And maybe not just yours, but maybe the other ones in the neighborhood that have been graffiti. And that approach can actually do more to change behavior when the person who did the tagging sees face to face the harm that they caused and the impact it has on somebody who's a good person than just sitting in a jail cell being vindictive or angry or what have you. Um, when you get into cases of sexual family violence, when you get into cases of domestic violence, homicide, restorative justice is harder and more complicated, obviously. Um, we secured the biggest grant in the history of the San Francisco DA's office my first year, a $6 million grant dedicated exclusively to expanding restorative justice. I'm sorry to tell you that the current district attorney has not referred a single person to those programs. Okay. Another one before we go online. Um, I have a question. You didn't really touch on it in your speech, but um, I was wondering what you think like the role of like conviction integrity review units and things like that have within the progressive prosecution. And I know you focus more on um, like harm reduction and things like that. Um, so, like, what do you think? Or do you think that has like a way in the path of the war. Absolutely. But anything that undermines the legitimacy of the system is, is something that has to be addressed, right? By any reform, whether you identify you know, as, as progressive or, or, or not. I mean, let me give you a couple examples and then I'll come back to the conviction integrity uh, one in your question. But um, money bail, something I mentioned. I mean, I was proud that the second policy I implemented was a prohibition on using money bail for pretrial detention. Money bail makes a mockery of equal protection and due process. It undermines public safety. All five of those officers in, uh, in Memphis have bailed out already. Well, if people accused of committing a brutal murder on video are out of custody the day after they're charged, that doesn't do a whole lot for public safety. Doesn't do a whole lot for equal protection of the law when people in the same jurisdiction accused of shoplifting languish behind bars because they can't come up with a cash payment. Right, those kinds of policies and practices, like wrongful convictions, do a tremendous amount of damage to the integrity of the judicial system. And if our system, if our rule of law doesn't have integrity, if people don't believe in it, then it ceases to function. Right? I mean, you all talk about the, in law school, you talk about the power of the purse and the power of the sword. And then you've got the gap, the black robe effect. If people don't respect the courts or the legal system because of things like wrongful convictions, because of double standards or blatantly biased policies and practices, then the system loses integrity. People stop cooperating. Witnesses don't come forward. They won't testify. Uh, and the rule of law across the board breaks down. So I created a wrongful conviction unit in my office. Um, I think it was a model unit. And I say that not to give myself credit, but we work with academics who are experts in the field and we let them design the, the, the programs. We wanted to have as much of a firewall as possible between our office and the work the um, wrongful conviction or conviction integrity unit was doing. And we wanted that because we recognized that there were lawyers in our office who've been prosecuting cases for decades. And if we're looking at an old murder case, for example, and considering whether or not someone was wrongfully convicted, there is inherently going to be an institutional bias against saying our office did something wrong. Partly, it exposes the city to liability for lawsuits. Uh, partly, the lawyers may still be on our team. In fact, in one case I was asked to review, where the Innocence Commission asked me to look, me personally, to look at a case where they had concerns, the person who had tried that case was my chief assistant been in the office for more than 20 years. Those kinds of relationships and biases and, and, and um, histories require extremely independent outside experts to look at cases, to evaluate cases, 
um, and then to have a decision made. And we did exonerate someone who had been wrongfully convicted for it. And I'm sure we would have gotten to other cases had I had more time on us. But I think those kinds of programs are a critical part of any reform-minded prosecutor's uh, agenda and administration. We have two time for two more. We're going to take one online and one from the woman in the green sweat. Abby. So you the microphone? Uh, or... Yes. Sorry. Sorry. No worries. Great. So someone online asks, I'm a law student who wants to be a progressive prosecutor, but there are, there are no truly progressive elected DAs in my state. If I accept a position at the ADA in the prosecution office that does business as legal, will I have a disruption? Will I have a discretion to be progressive even if my boss is not? Or will I be part of the problem rather than part of the solution? What career paths do you recommend for that situation? Thanks for the question. It's a it's a big one. And um, I know I'm doing uh, some office hours this week, and it's probably the kind of thing we could unpack more fully um, in office hours and in a short answer. But what I'll say is this. Um, much more than public defender's offices, district attorney's offices tend to be very hierarchical. And there are some good reasons for that. Um, you want to have uniformity of, of policy and practice. You don't want one defendant whose case is assigned to a particular prosecutor to have a very different outcome than another defendant simply because they were assigned a different prosecutor. But what that means is if you're working in an office where you don't respect or agree with the policies and politics of the boss, you are unlikely to have the kind of discretion that it sounds like they're seeking. Um, so what career path would I suggest? Well, one thing is there are lots of states and lots of jurisdictions with prosecutors who probably are closer to your values. And one of the great things about a legal career is you can go practice anywhere in the country or the world. Now, you may have to take a separate state bar. I did that. Um, it's not fun to have to study for two bar exams, but it's not a bad thing to be licensed to practice in multiple jurisdictions. So I would encourage you to find an office where you really believe in the work that's being done and you can take pride in your work. Being a lawyer, whatever area of law you go into, is hard work. And um, I say that as a fourth generation lawyer. I'm wearing my grandfather's wristwatch from, uh, from his legal practice about 100 years ago. Um, being a lawyer is hard work, but you can do amazing things with it. The problem is most lawyers, many lawyers don't like their careers. Many lawyers are depressed. They have one of the highest dissatisfaction rates of any profession. So I would urge both the person who asked that question and all of you to pursue a career doing work that is meaningful to you. You'll be happier. You'll do better work. You'll make a bigger impact in the process. Last question. So I, I'm an SM president, and I think that there are was the rise of, you know, homelessness and living in COVID, and I worked in the tender line, and I saw a lot of that, and I wanted to ask, you know, what were your plans for the state in terms of, like, what institutional barriers did you come across that you were not able to, you know, fully like, see the potential of your policies? Thanks so much for the, uh, for the question, and I actually really appreciate being able to address it. Uh, also, I want to just point out for all of you who are critical listeners, she didn't vote to recall me, but she didn't vote against it either. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, I'm Steve. Um, the, uh, so I think your question is important for a couple of reasons, right? So let me, let me take it in two parts. One is um, a lot of the attacks, the criticism that I've received were about allegedly rising crime rates. And the folks who were critical of me who were supporting the recall would cherry pick individual categories of crime or neighborhoods or date ranges to say crime is out of control. If you look at the two and a half years I was in office and you compare it to the two and a half years prior to my administration, overall crime fell by 20%. And that's true for both violent and nonviolent crime. Now, it's also true that certain categories of crime like garage burglaries went way up, like overdoses from opioids went way up. And so the folks who were my detractors wanted to focus on those negative shootings went up without any comparison either to what was happening in, say, Oakland, across the bridge from us, where those crime trends were far worse, or other big cities or red counties in California where those trends were far worse. We lived through, in my administration, an unprecedented moment in American history. And is it any surprise to people that the COVID pandemic changed crime trends in San Francisco and other places? Of course, it's not a surprise. So I think it's important if we're going to have an honest conversation about shortcomings, successes, that we recognize first and foremost, 
all academic research confirms district attorneys do not have any ability to influence short-term crime trends. I would love to take full credit for the fact that crime fell 20% during my administration. I don't deserve that credit, just like I don't deserve to be blamed for the individual categories that went up. You also asked specifically about homelessness. The tenderloin for folks who aren't familiar is a really rough part of San Francisco. Every city has areas like this, right? The South Bronx in Manhattan, for example, and in New York, for example. Um, um, you know, in Chicago, the, the, the Southwest side. Um, but the Tenderloin is unique in some ways because it's right on top of our city hall. It's right on top of our mid-market street district where all of our main public transit and commuters and um, and, and so much of the of, of the of the financial hub of the city is based. And it's been really devastating for businesses that are trying, small businesses and large alike, to have massive open-air drug markets on their front, literally on their front steps. Homelessness. San Francisco has about 8,000 unhoused people. That is not the responsibility of the district attorney. Let me be clear. It is not the responsibility of the district attorney in San Francisco, in Boston, or Chicago, or any other city to address homelessness. But most people in San Francisco during my administration thought it was. Let me explain why it is. First of all, being poor or homeless is not a crime. So you don't have any ability to use your enforcement power. In fact, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals a couple of years ago in a case out of Boise, Idaho, a case by the same name, specifically ruled that as a matter of constitutional law, local jurisdictions cannot criminally prosecute people for camping in unpermitted areas unless first establishing that there were available shelter beds they chose not to use. San Francisco doesn't have available shelter beds, ever. So the solution to that problem is to build more shelter beds, to build more affordable, supportive housing. And in fact, our city has a department of homelessness, of affordable housing, with a budget more than five times greater than the entire budget of the district attorney's office. So yes, those are real problems. And the connection, which I think so many people make to district attorneys, is because when you're walking down the street and you see a homeless man, especially if you're a young mother with a baby, or you're an elderly person walking with a cane, or you're an immigrant that doesn't speak English and know your way around well, or any number of other vulnerable groups, it is normal and understandable that you might feel less safe when you're walking through a homeless camp, when you see evidently stolen property or open-air drug use. And when people feel unsafe, they want the police and the district attorney to solve the problem. But these are problems that cannot, we cannot prosecute our way out of. We cannot incarcerate our way out of poverty. And so I would say to you and others from San Francisco, demand more from City Hall. San Francisco has a $14 billion budget. Why can't we find housing for the 8,000 unhoused people in our city? Why are we looking to the jail as a place to house them? And I'll save any further comments for Wednesday. later in the week or Wednesday, Wednesday at lunch. Thank you all so much. Um, and and Chase, in particular, for incredibly provocative and scintillating talk, and a reminder that democracy is our highest aspiration, but it can also be problematic in some circumstances. Um, I want to say if anybody wants to hear more, um, my class is at 3 p.m. in this room. We have about 25 students in the front, but others are welcome to come and sit in the back if you just want to observe. But it'll be for one hour in that class. And also that uh, we will be posting office hours during the week if you wanted to meet one-on-one -on -one, uh, with Chase, so that you're welcome to check our website and you can find opportunities to have those conversations. Thank you again.